emergency podcast, sound the alarm. Dylan, 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 Dylan. Chonovechen has left Jumbo Visma to go to Team Bike Exchange. Maybe there'll be a new Tietema remix. Saturday morning news breaks. Gronovechen shock transfer to Bike Exchange. We're going to speak as well in this podcast, uh, which is in full form on podcast players, on uh, Tej Benoit leaving DSM to Jumbo Visma, on the OMI OP final judgment, as well as uh, the Olivia Ray criterium issues that have happened in this last week. It almost looks like a genuine transfer. The big sprinter for Jumbo Visma, winner of Tour de France stages. He's came back from suspension in the Giro. Benji, you've got the press releases ready from both teams, kind of the the, the opposite of what we saw with Ilan van Wilde DSM to quick step in terms of PR here. Yes, certainly. We had a situation where at 9.59 this morning, European time, Jumbo released a press release. Uh, we grant Kronenwegen transfer opportunity for sporting reasons. Like, first thing that comes to mind when reading that title is sporting reasons being that he probably didn't fit in the Tour de France team, but we'll talk about that after I finish reading this uh, short summary of the uh, article that they brought out. Basically, they say, oh, we're happy with how Grunewagen wrote for us. He's done a lot for us in the past. And he received an offer from a team, an attractive sportive offer from another team for next season. And they decided to dissolve the contract after mutually agreeing on it. There's not too much more outside of that in this article. So it's basically just hyping up the career he had with Jumbo Visma. And I think that's a good thing because, uh, yeah, it's, it's indeed the opposite of what Von Wilder had, right? The Ilan van Wilder quick step thing, yeah, just it was a bit a sour taste in everyone's mouth, it seemed. Whereas Gronewegen, it's pretty obvious here. He won Tour de France stages in 17, 18, 19. 2020 doesn't get taken to the Tour de France because they're going for Roglic and Van Aert. 2021 doesn't get taken to the Tour de France, probably also maybe not in the best condition for it. It's like he's 28 years old. He's probably maybe thinking, I've got three, four years left at the top. He still is at the top, in my view. I think he's still a top, top. Yeah sprinter and so it makes sense he wants to he wants to go what i want to bring out of that press release from Jumbo visma benji is they said he came to us with an attractive offer from another team and he was already under contract with Jumbo visma so what i'd i'd like to know is i got to check the uci rules i assumed if you you can't just go to another team and say to a rider under contract for 2022 hey do you want to ride for us and give them an offer is isn't that like tampering i presume that's prohibited but maybe that's just agents. I know that agents can't tamper with riders who are with other agents, but um, maybe Jumbo Visma gave him permission. They're like, listen, you're not going to tour next year. Go out to the market, see what offers you can get. If you get one, come back to us and uh, away we go. What I want to ask me, oh, the Bex, before we get to the Bex press release and the Bex side of this, Benji, you reckon Jumbo Visma got a kickback from this or this is all about they get a salary off the books for a guy they're not even sending to the tour anyway? I think it's the latter because we have to look at what they did there. And yes, they had uh, Wout van Aert go to the Tour de France instead of Grunewagen for the last two years. And it paid off for them. Like, to be honest, it paid off. And it's not like they don't have young sprinters in their team either. Koy and Decker are lining up for races. And we were speaking about it already at the Giro preview, I think. Which sprinter are they sending to the Giro? And now it's likely not going to be Grunewagen for Jumbo because uh, he's not at the team anymore. So... Are they going to offer up an opportunity to Koy and Decker, who might be lining up for a Grand Tour for their first time, second time for Decker um, this year then, in 2022? I don't know. It's uh, it's definitely an opportunity now, and I think it is a good situation for all parties involved. You've got Yumbo, who is losing their salary, like you said, the salary of Kronenwegen off their books. Yes, they probably would have been happy to keep him just because they have a, a good relationship with the man, most likely. That's what I can read from the uh, press release at least. But then again, that could be for PR purposes. But um, all in all, I think for Grunewagen as well, it's a good option because, yeah, he's one of the best sprinters in the world and he wants to do the best races in the world. And if you can't ride the Tour de France, then you can't ride the best races in the world. I think this just makes so much sense from from all sides in that Jumbo gets salary off books for a guy who they're not using to justify you know that salary which is big tour de france wins because they have other objectives and then okay you send them to the giro well they have as we we've spoken about before a core of young sprinters coming through and already we saw decker's opportunities being curtailed by Gronewegen in the giro d'italia so that opens up coy and decker now in giro vuelta 
And then for Grotevecken, it's like, as I said, you got a limited peak. And then now moving to Bike Exchange, Benji, they've got some statements from Copeland, I, I believe, but for Bike Exchange. But we mentioned we just did the Bike Exchange preview. It's almost like they listened to the preview. By the way, we did the preview off the back of we, we made sure they announced their full roster because we were a lot of teams haven't. And they were like, okay, we're, we're safe to do Bex. I interviewed their new lead out man, Kel O'Brien, who didn't, you know, I didn't know about this either. And um, and then this drops like three four days l- later. But for bike exchange, Benji, as we said, they had no. You you really you're not as high on Groves as me. But even I'm not I'm not delusional. I'm just saying, Caden Groves go to the Tour de France, going to win sprint stages next year. Do you think they've this is to take the load off Matthews, and they're going to send Corona Vegan as premium sprint to the Tour de France, and have Matthews do Giro of Vuelta? 100% when it comes to sending Grunewagen to the Tour de France, I'm not sure about the Machu situation yet, but I feel like Grunewagen is one of the best sprinters in the world, and if you sign him, then you're definitely going to be lining up for the Tour de France, because we spoke in our bike exchange preview very recently that we feel like this is a team with a lot of miscellaneous riders in it, and with a Grand Tour team, with Simon Yates going to the Giro, for example, then you're going to need to have a prime leader that can win races left and right and you can't just send Lucas Hamilton for GC alone and expect yeah. that to work out so we were already thinking Simon Yates could go there for stage wins and so forth with Grunewagen going there that's much better because you actually have options of winning Tour de France stages with him next to that next to the Tour de France they can definitely get more victories like this along the way because we also weren't very high when it comes to their wins throughout the season but I do believe they're going to win races with Grunewagen as a sprinter but the question there is now He's signing up for three years. Who do they have in they, their team? Matthews, Mesgetch. They have uh, Kel O'Brien, for example. They've got quite a few riders that have a sprint and quite a few riders that could fit in a bit of a sprint train. But does Grunewagen even need a sprint train at the Tour de France? Or does he just need one rider that brings him to the front in the wheel of the Koenig? I think, I think sprint trains are kind of overrated. FDJ had a great sprint train. And... At the end of the day, that meant that they often in races like Provence, etc., would go to the front, try and control things from like three Ks to go. They even did it in the Vuelta, and then they get swamped. Alperson, Alperson used their sprint train. Uh, we're going to talk sprint train in terms of controlling stages from far. I think Bex are also a bit light, but Alperson will control from far. But then when it gets to the run-in, they disappear. Go and watch the Tour de France sprint stages that Cavendish won. Quick step are not at the front at three Ks to go. They're not there. They go to the back of the pelts because, like, hot take, you don't win the race at three Ks to go. There's no finish line there. You want to be at the front when it matters. And quick step came to the front with 1,600 meters to go. And even then, sometimes a little bit early, and Alperson could come up late. And so I think it's more important to have a good last man. I think Turnison was is an underrated last man. The question is, can... The more important question is not can they put f- four guys together in a sprint train. It's more can Kel O'Brien and Mezgetz, those two, or another guy with Mezgetz and Gronewegen, can they get Gronewegen in top five wheels with 250 meters to go and with a bit of space? And if, if they can do that, then it should be okay. I, I think they should be able to do that. In terms of good lead outs, Benji, I see Alps and Quick Step, and then the rest is mm-hmm. meh, like Lotto. Jury's out on them. So, yeah, what's your view on it? Like, because I think Grunewagen should be fine. I think he should be fine as well. He's won a lot without leadouts in the past, but also the fact that he's got this mate in the team. Amon Grundal Janssen rode with him quite a few times in his sprint trains in the past, but also as a rider that solely was there to bring a sprinter to the front. It's with Wout van Aert in that. Was it Tour de France? Uh, I don't know. I recall the Turnison victory in Brussels at the Tour de France start. In one of the years, I think it was 2019, I could be wrong at that, but um, uh, I feel like uh, Janssen was important there to get Turnison to the front, to get riders to the front last minute, to try and get those stage wins, same way that Janssen did so for Wout van Aert in that stage win where Viviani had uh, his weird face looking at Wout van Aert crossing the line, winning his first uh, <laughs> Tour de France sprint. So uh, all those things combined, I think that Janssen can do this, but he hasn't really shown much in the year that he was at Bike Exchange, so that's the worry there. Mezgetch and uh, Matthews, I don't see Matthews being a lead out. Uh, that's straightforward for me. He's done so for Case Bull in the past, but that didn't go very far at DSM. But then again, that's mainly uh, partially DSM's fault, I would say. But um, 
yeah, all in all, I think that he's going to be fine here and he's going to win stages. I think, yeah, I'd just like to really commend both teams actually on how this has been handled, even if it wasn't even if it wasn't so amicable behind closed doors, public facing, this looks like, you know, very professionally done. And if you're Jumbo Visma, you've just avoided what you've seen happen for the last three, four years at Bora Hansgrohe. You, they have the Peter Sagan equivalent in Wow Fun Art in in the guy that the superstar going for green, and then they've got a guy like Bennett or Ackerman, Dylan Kronenwegen sitting behind, who's a top sprinter de- being denied opportunities. They've avoided all those problems and nastiness, and they've also saved themselves some money. So it makes so much sense for both teams. And as Benji said. We were looking at Matthews and Simon Yates, and then where else could they be winning races from a bike exchange? They've now added a guy who should win more races than both of those two. Uh, so combined, combined, most likely, yeah, and yeah, and it frees up Matthews. And I went on a pretty impassioned defense of Matthews in the Brex preview, just saying, listen, there's not many riders who's the Cobble Classics leader, Arden leader, Tour de France bunch sprint leader, green leader, Vuelta sprinter, and also, you know, trying to go for hilly stage in Vuelta and Paranese. So this takes a load off Matthews, and I'd like to see Benji, you know, Brugge de Pana, he doesn't have to do anymore. Send Groenewegen. Um, Those races, it just it takes a bit of a load off there. But, yeah, I think it's great. And uh, what would you have a hot take, Benji? How many World Tour races does Groenewegen win in 2022? I think he wins three. I think he wins... Four. Four. Yeah. Welter wins, right? Not Grand Tour wins. So Yeah, that's that's a lot, but he's pretty good. And he's he'll be back. fine. He'll be fine. <laughs> anyway, that's the Dylan Gronovegan shock transfer. Let us know. Were you surprised? I was frankly I was surprised. Like yeah, but <laughs> then it made a lot of sense when I sort of thought through it. Uh, particularly as it dropped on a Saturday morning. Probably just before was he I think he's probably about to get on a flight, Benji, to their team camp, unless they're already there. So to go on a flight elsewhere to their to the bike exchange team camp, which is soon. But anyway, moving on to the next news, which is uh, Taish Benoit leaving DSM, and this is kind of the opposite. But before we do that, mention our show partner Lacole, who produced performance cycling apparel based in the UK, expanding quickly internationally, now sponsoring Bora Hansgrohe back in the World Tour next year, as well as ambassadors Cancellara, Wiggins, and Johan Museu, who I think Benji says he sees occasionally on rides in the Lacole kit. But if you want to check them out, they're at www.lacole.cc. They've been supporting the show since its inception last year. That's www.lacole.cc. The note leaves DSM. He goes to Yumbo Visma, Benji. And I think this is the perfect signing for Jumbo Visma in that there's also not a lot of riders who can cobble, who can do a bit of a sprint lead out third to second last man and who can do medium mountains or some steady gradient high mountains in stage races as a domestique as well. So the opposite really in PR though, Benji, when the DSM press release was like, Tej could not deliver on his promises to the team, so he's <laughs> leaving. Like, Why do they do that? It's so it's just fucking so stupid. stupid. Uh, yeah, I agree, because like you've got this... Uh, Tish Benoit is one of those writers where he's always honest in interviews, he's always talking about everything that went wrong and is very critical to that, but also gives constructive feedback to that in interviews and so forth, how he could do better. So he's kind of always reevaluating what he does wrong, and I feel it very unbelievable that he's the kind of writer that is so annoyed by everything going around in, in DSM that he's becoming a really annoying guy in the team. That doesn't feel like Tish Benoit to me. But all in all, I uh, I don't like how they handled this, and it's the same with a lot of stuff that DSM has handled in the last couple of weeks. I do truly believe, just like you, that it's a great transfer for Yumbo. Uh, well, quite simply because he's very versatile. We've spoken a lot about the lack of support with Wout van Aert, the lack of support that the Wout van Aert had in the couple races this season. And that's partially because Turnison was injured at a certain point at the start of the season, but also we've seen quite a few improvements for that for the next season. And I think that Benoit coming to this team with Laporte as well, that's an addition to that team that Benoit might even be in the finals of those races, helping out about Fanat. While, yeah, while he didn't really have that outside of Hans Wevelgem where he had not Nathan van Hoydonk, for example. So he just has more supporting cobble races. And like you said, he's very versatile, meaning he can do so in other races as well. 
Plus, he's also slightly competitive. Just in case you send him to a smaller range, he can still do something. But one thing I don't see happening is that I don't see him following those uh, one-week stage race dreams that I heard him speak about a year or two ago. So that's something that I don't <laughs> see happening. But I don't believe that's too much of an issue. Like, he's not the youngest really? guy. He's not 22. Yeah, what? Well, isn't, isn't that what he wants, though? Like, isn't, isn't that why he might have been unhappy? Uh, I don't think... Uh... That's an option here at Yumbo. Yeah, well, no, I agree in that. If I'm Yumbo Visra, I'm like, Tesh, there ain't going to be no Paranese GC anymore. We've got Dumoulin, Jonas, and Roglic, and Kroos, like, it's probably even better than him as well. Like, you know, I see him here as almost complete domestique. Yeah, and, like, what is it with riders who have a very clear versatility in multiple terrains where they're very damn good, and then they out of nowhere decide we're going to focus on one week stage races or I'm going to try and podium the Tour de France like Lutsenko said the other day. Like, mate, you can win three Grand Tour stages if you focus on it and are in good form. Why would you do that? <laughs> then, then end up sixth in the end. <laughs> like, I don't know. I feel like um, I see a lot of riders who have this very good aspect and then decide to follow other goals that are less entertaining but also less interesting and less likely to happen. And yes, riders can always dream of those, but you've, you've got strengths, use them. Just to remind people of that versatility, this year, fifth at Paranese GC with two to uh, a sixth on Colmian, the, the mountain stage, 15th at E3, 12th at RVV, 15th at Amstel, 7th at Liège, and then 8th at Benelux Tour. And then I think at the Olympic road race, he did a uh, lead out. He did a pull for Wavanak on the Cooney pass. But uh, yeah, I just, even if, even if he just focused on all those things, I don't really, I just see him still as a domestique, even if he honed in on those things. And now that Wavanak, no excuses anymore for Wavanak in the classics. You're going from basically Van Hooydonk now to Turnison, Laporte, Teich Benoit, and Nathan Van Hooydonk. That's a pretty good score. Very, very, very good squad, actually. So, yeah, that's uh, we'll see how well Fanart goes next year. But yeah, good for Tej Benoit, I guess, going to to Jumbo Visma. I'll see how his this will be interesting to see how his TT goes, Benji, because he came 47th in Paris in that TT. I think he, I think his TT will improve just by just by seeing the difference in setups next year. Uh, yeah, but will he need it if he doesn't go for one week yeah, stage race? True. I mean, <laughs> couldn't he? Couldn't he? Do, couldn't he win Benelux or podium Benelux? I guess they got Dumo there. Yeah, they they could still have Tijman. I would go for Benelux. You're right, but is it that big of a deal <laughs> oh, for Yumbo at least? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I guess probably not. And he's been doing like Tour de Swiss, etc., for GC in in previous years. But that's Tej Benoit move. We'll cover more on de that sort of in detail on DSM podcast, the, their team preview. We'll talk about what the hell is going on DSM. Obviously, the big article dropped on the day of their team launch. I almost felt sorry for them <laughs> on Sportsa about the culture and the team. And then I will also cover Benoit and Van Aert, etc., in the classics uh, in the Yumbo Visma preview. But other news and let us know would you like a sort of more formal every week in the off season like a news roundup because there's been so much news in the off season it's been it's been you know very busy but this news omi opi opi omi judgment benji the woman you know i think early 30s who crashed tony martin or tony martin crashed into her has been fined by the correct, criminal correction court in Brest, 1,500 euro, I think, or 1,100 euro, and then she got another 500 euro fine, and she paid a one euro symbolic fine to the Riders Association, the French one. And that's no, no, no jail time, nothing else, just sort of a symbolic, I know, 1,500 euros, a fair chunk of change, but it's not, it's not going to like bankrupt most people. Yeah. Um, do you think this is – I think it's reasonable given that the deterrent is – her face was on the media for like two months and that would have been pretty scary. Yeah, this was one of the most viral events in cycling in the last few years, I would dare to say, because I saw YouTubers and news uh, outlets across the universe – well, across the world 
uh, all broadcast this event. And yeah, it's an incident that is not something that we like to be representative of our sport when we watch cycling, but it happened and it became pretty viral. As a consequence, there's a lot of criticism to this one person. And I think this money is not the biggest penalty here for this person. I think the biggest punishment is that she basically got scrutinized for multiple months, which in my opinion, kind of deservedly because, uh, yeah, she didn't kind of uh, ruin uh, the first day of the Tour de France for us, but uh, and certainly for the riders, which is the worst part of it all. And um, yeah, all in all, I would dare to say that I find it good that it's not a jail time kind of thing, because I saw very mixed reactions on social media surrounding this punishment in the sense that some people were like, yeah, that's fine. That's good. Because like she already had the biggest thing being the sensibilization campaign that it brought that you shouldn't be having a cardboard in the middle of the road when you're by the side of the road, stuff like that. Like everybody has seen the event that is near to cycling and everybody knows now we probably shouldn't do that. There's always going to be one idiot that does it again, obviously. But um, yeah, I feel like that is the biggest important factor here. The fact that I dare to say people should now know that this is stupid to do. And yes, uh, I don't know. You're the lawyer here. Like, what if I take a cardboard, stand by the side of the road, and a random bike rider rides into it? <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, you'd probably still be in trouble. What if you stood in the middle of the road and just held out a sign, and someone and that traffic went into you? Yeah, that's yeah. that's a problem. Would it be a bigger problem than a twelve hundred dollar fine? Pro- like, depends on the injuries or the cost of the damage like if you wreck your bike most bikes cost more than that so yeah probably more than that and she certainly caused over a hundred thousand euros worth of damage i think to bikes and probably what's the cost to movistar or where's the asher Sutherland? you know those guys yeah like is obviously the fine is not representative of the actual economic damage she caused but would jail time what would what would it achieve like is she is she a persistent like who's that guy who keeps going into like in the UK who keeps going into uh, stadiums to like impersonate players and goes on the pitch all the time the pitch invader I, I'm not sure she's a persistent offender that you know needs to be sent to jail well I, I doubt it if she, I, if she does it again send her to jail but as well it, it did as Ben you said spark the conversation about okay. The messaging then came out from Tour de France about spectators respecting the riders, etc. They sometimes don't expect how quickly they come up to you, how they use all of the road. Still, we see, like, I, I'll be honest, I preferred it when there was no fans. Yeah, COVID race, <laughs> I preferred it. I get really stressed out on mountain stages, and I think yep. seeing fans running by riders, it just makes no sense to me. Just absolute idiots. And that still happens. And, you know, imagine like imagine like Champions League a, a plays through on goal and they get knocked they get knocked to the ground by a pitch invader. Like imagine a rider on a mountain stage or having a Lopez, you know, knocked to the ground. Like it's it's crazy that sort of it happens in cycling. And then even people got mad at Lopez for giving that guy a few a few taps that he deserved. Anyway, Omiopi's done. Small fine, uh, four or five months later, and uh, we'll see. We'll see what the messaging is like next year. I reckon they might use it, you know, before the tour next year, Benji. I wouldn't be surprised to see campaigns about this showing the damage that can happen uh, for next year. But yeah, um, I even sorry last before last point. I even think Plugger, if I, I might be misquoting, Plugger was like, I he's like, forget the court stuff. He would have preferred if. They'd used her and she became like a spokesperson in, in some campaigns for rider safety. Would have been more productive in his view, the head of the manager of Yumbo Visma, which I'm inclined to agree with. Uh, that's a bit of a Yumbo Visma love party, this this podcast, unlike unlike <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, last news this week, and this has been throughout this week, and maybe it's just because it's the off season. Uh, this blew up mostly on Twitter and it, Mentioning this mainly because we mentioned this rider, coincidentally, in our Tour de France Femme Avec Zwift parkour review as a potential rider to win the first stage and take the yellow jersey. It's Olivia Ray on uh, Ray, no, Ray on Rally Cycling. They're going to be called Human Powered Health next year, going up to World Tour level. So that we sh- you should expect to see her in Europe next year, 23-year-old sprinter from New Zealand. 
Anyway, she raced uh, into the Lion's Den Criterium, uh, I think, like 40 days ago in October, which was billed as like the highest paying criterium and one of the highest prize pools for women in all cycling this year. And there was like a 15,000 US dollar check for the winner of the women's race, which she won. And she posted on Twitter being like, I haven't been paid by uh, the race yet. This was, you know, this week, which was, I think it was like 37 days later. Yep. She'd also mess- emailed, I believe, Cycling News. Cycling News had, con- had then spoken to her and her team rally saying they'd reached out to the organizer to ask, where's the, uh, where's the payment? And they hadn't received contact back from Into the Lion's Den, race organizer, and then she took to Twitter about it. And then it blew up on Twitter. And there's lots of various reactions, Benji. Now, my initial reaction was it's perfectly normal to not be paid, I think, up to 60 days because there's a 30-day payment or 28-day payment after the event for the sponsors paying the race organizer, and then they need to have a buffer to then pay pay out. And I think UCI races are supposed to be within 90 days, but 60 days seems fine. So this is within 60 days. I think what the problem here is the she, they didn't seem to get a response from the race organizer, which kind of raised alarm bells. And when there's a huge prize pool on offer, and when it's 15k and you're a women's pro, a pro conti rider, not a world tour rider, like yeah. that's a lot of money. And I think, first of all, like, do you think she really did anything wrong by taking to Twitter or talking to Cycling News about this? I believe it all depends on the situations behind the scenes. What I read from this uh, entire storyline is that. It seems like she had no answer. She didn't get any response from the organizers. And as a consequence, yeah, obviously you're going to get triggered by that. Even if it's 37 days, if you ask them stuff about it and they don't respond well, then you're going to take it publicly because they're not responding to you. Like, I find that a logical reaction. I really don't blame uh, Olivia for doing that here. So if that is the case, then uh, I don't see the issue here. And I I agree that 60 days is kind of the, the region I'd be looking at as well. But that is in case you know that it will be paid in those 60 days. She was in the situation, apparently, where she did not get the answer and, as a consequence, wasn't sure. So uh, that's why it was uh, thrown on Twitter. And obviously, when people see it on Twitter, it gets shared and people start um, bashing the organizers. And I think that's where everything uh, doubled, I think, the situation. A bit of a a burning effect. Everything uh, just exploded from that point onwards. Well, yeah, that's why we waited. We wanted to see everyone everyone have a chance to say their side of it because she initially tweets that and I'm like, it looks bad, but I don't know. They, we don't know at that point. Have, they could have emailed her back, Benji, being like, we're paying you next week. We, you don't know that at that point. And I was thinking, okay, maybe the race organizer is going to come out and be like, listen, we, we've had clear lines of communication. We told them all two weeks ago, listen, we're getting the check in, etc." But that didn't appear to happen. And uh, Cycling Tips did a pretty bizarre piece on this, frankly. Um, and, yeah, like I thought it was quite odd. Uh, basically being like, yeah, the it, it didn't really confirm that – it didn't really say clearly that Ray had reached out and not received answers. And then, But it did confirm that the money sort of wasn't there and it was only when she tweeted that then they started get, she started getting answers – and the organizers still haven't made a public statement about it uh, to date, which is the morning of Saturday, 11th of December. So very odd. What was also sort of I found pretty appalling, frankly, was some of the comments from I think it was Ty Williams or Ty Magna. I think that yeah. two different Both. people on the Legion team who basically called it like they implied that she was acting like a child, like pretty directly on twitter and then they're like there was like a let them eat cake let them race for gift cards post and they weren't taken down pretty quickly and i thought that was pretty uh, disgraceful Appalling. frankly yeah. yeah one of the one of the things that i saw was that someone i think uh spoke in dm to ty williams and got the response oh if you think this then you clearly don't know anything about bike racing like very offensive and the kind of uh effect from someone that is triggered and that uh, just responds very uh i don't know very impulsively on something and probably regrets it at this point for doing so because uh ty magner's uh twitter account is now gone at this point i have not checked ty williams's twitter account if that's gone as well but just a lot of twitter action started happening and social media action because just a few 
what, days later? Like a day or two later or a day later, we saw that Olivia Ray's post was gone and her Twitter account was was inactive at a certain point and her Instagram account at some point as well. What do you think the story is behind that? I don't know. I don't know whether you'll, – you'll never know whether she was forced to post it because like that's – the point of one of, the, of a forced apology you don't come out and be like yeah we forced her to apologize it kind, of devalu- <laughs> kind of devalues it so you'll never know but it reads like the most scripted forced apology ever and it's it's so over the top that it's almost yeah. like it's it's literally unbelievable like it says you know i had no cause to do this so I said, well you did have cause <laughs> like people weren't responding yeah. to your emails and again as i say 60 day payment or even ninety day payment if that's if there's clear timelines or time frames given I don't I see no problem with that. It's a huge pot of money for a criterion. It makes sense that it takes time to get that all organized. But this blew up, as Benji said, into a PR disaster because there was but poor communication. If you tell the writers when it's happening, this doesn't happen. And even if you tell them when it's happening, oh, you know and then they go on Twitter and roast you, you can be like, excuse me? Like, we told you it's going to be paid in 60 days. Like, why are you going on Twitter? And that didn't happen. So yep. even even then, Benji, it still couldn't have been a big problem if if they just if, if the organizer just responded to her tweet being like, sorry about the communication issues, Olivia. Uh, we've sent you a DM uh, just giving you further details and, you know, we can hopefully we can resolve exactly. it. It, com- it dies, completely dies. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. It's it's crazy how, like, it's so obvious how this could have gone very differently if they even s- just spoke a little bit more. We wouldn't be talking about it. Yeah, we wouldn't be talking about it. There wouldn't be articles left and right about it. They wouldn't be scrutinized on Twitter because this is obviously having a bit of a PR disaster towards both the organizers, which is also a legion at this point, and uh, those writers who are involved in that uh, entire situation on social media. So, yeah, that would all have been avoided if communication happened. Yeah, so, yeah, a bit of a strange, and it's like, oh, you know, why Why are you covering it? It's American domestic racing, I guess. Well, Olivia Ray is going on, onto a world tour team next year, and it's a huge prize pot, whether it's a world tour race or not, although that is a distinction between this race and, say, a Joe Martin stage race in that I don't believe there was anti-doping at this race because it's not a i don't think it's a uci race so yep. usually i think the the argument for uci races whether it's plausible or not is that they wait to pay out later because they want to wait till the anti-doping results clear so they don't give money to someone who's who's cheated but that doesn't really really apply here and it turns out benji from the cycling tips article she was kind of right to be questioning it in that the money seemed to only drop like last week so yeah. and it, and the article even says it might be there, it might not be there. So if, if I was her, yeah, there seemed to be a few alarm bells. But anyway, hopefully hopefully that all gets resolved uh, shortly. I, I look forward to seeing her for human-powered health competing at the Tour de France. Tour de France, that, that, that name. <laughs> human-powered health, yeah. Yeah, like it's it's not a good name. Rally was a great name for a team. Yeah, human-powered yeah. health is not. HBH. <laughs> HPH. <laughs> Damn, when you put it like that. Yeah, that is funny. But I look forward to Olivia Ray at HPH taking out the Tour de France <laughs> Fan Avex with Sprint next uh first stage sprint next year. Maybe. We'll see how she goes. She got some big numbers. But that's been our sort of weekly news wrap up. Hope you enjoyed it, this emergency podcast. And let us know down below whether you'd like us to do a sort of similar thing throughout the off season in future. Make sure you give us a review on podcast players or like the video down below on YouTube. Thanks to the call for supporting the podcast and we'll see you in the next one. Ciao.